Watch it. I should have brought a pile up here. Oh, well, you're fine. She's running for more coffee. She's gonna have you going for more coffee? Yes, I am. Good girl. All right. <laughs> I'll be back. She said one cup this morning just wouldn't do it. <laughs> one, one cup wouldn't do it? <laughs> Were you there for early service? Yes. Or, or, was she there for early yes. service? Yes. I thought maybe I, I put her, so I put her to sleep. <laughs> she didn't have any before, that's why. I put her to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, well, welcome. Um, we sh you're in week four. We cannot but speak. Um, Mark chapter 1, 16 to 20 in particular, Acts chapter 4, verses 5 to 31. Right? And uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you rose from the dead for us and that you have called us to be your witnesses. Help us as we discuss the lesson this week and prepare us. We pray to, to be faithful witnesses, to speak the truth in love, that many more people may come to know the, the peace and hope, the forgiveness, the life that is ours through you, Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So again, for some of you, I, um, just a reminder, my per the, the, the primary purpose of this is not for me to impart things to you as much as it is for us to, to talk through some of, these, some of these questions. And we're, we're expecting that you're doing this stuff at home so that we, when we come in here, we can, uh, we can discuss some things. And first of all, is, is there anything that, that that struck any of you that you picked up on that, or a question that you had from the study, any of those that I could do first of all? That would certainly, for me or whoever else would teach this class in the future, if you run across something that is confusing to you or you need to circle it, write it off on the side, feel free to ask and we'll do the best we can to try and help you out. Okay. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start on page two. If that's all right. And number three. And that's Acts 4, 8 through 11, where Peter and John are, are talking before talking before the council. This Jesus whom you crucified, whom God, whom God raised. God raised from the dead. Um, Pastor Boardman writes the writes the initial draft of these studies, and then I do significant editing to them. This so this this has a there's a cadence to this that you that you can kind of see is uh, and we see this in several places in the New Testament. Maybe this is the, the beginnings of a, a creed. Right? Jesus died and he rose. And we see this in other places. Um, what is what's present? So the question before us is, is, what's present in this part of the conversation here that should inform all of Christian witness? And in, in, in what Peter and John speak. Christ is the one. I mean, is the person we said he was. And yeah. From the yep. Right. So Christ is Christ is who he said he was. So he is what. He's the Messiah. Keep going. The promised one. The promised one, right? What is further, furthermore? Fulfillment. Fulfillment, right? Fulfillment of all these Old Testament prophecies, right? Um, part, of the Holy Trinity. part there we go. That's so that's part of what I was driving at with asking the question. He's not just a prophet, but he's also by kind of, he's also God, right? Um, so that's certainly there. Think about the previous couple of weeks. We talked about what, you know, in particular, we go back to the Pentecost sermon. What should you expect in a, you know, the core, core things in a, in, a, in a sermon or any Christian teaching? Oh, well, gospel. gospel. Well, gospel, right? <laughs> now, for those who might watch on the internet and might not be of the, from Lutheran circles, that's worth, so when we talk about law and gospel, what are we talking about? Sin. Sin, how so? What do you mean by Right, so, so that, that that's spoken of, right? That the scriptures are preached and taught in such a way that we see our own responsibility for the for the cross. And it's and all of us are 
that we're all we're all guilty. And so here here we are, um, because we're in verses eight through eleven. Let's find it here. Let it be known. I'm in verse ten. Let it be known to you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom whom you crucified, right, standing before the very council, you know, that had become a kangaroo court that had led to Jesus' death, you know, they're not pulling any punches here. Um, we're going to come back to this. We're going to come back to this again, but he has his chance. You know, he's called before them, and there's, there's little regard for what the consequences will be for him. You know, these folks need to hear. All right, so this Jesus whom you crucified, then they said, what? God raised from whom God raised from the dead, right? He, he, you know, remember who we're talking to here? Who are a lot of the, who are a lot of the leaders of this council? Scribes and Pharisees, and Pharisees in particular, Sadducees. And what do the Sadducees not believe in? The resurrection. They also deny also what in terms of the scriptures. Yeah? That's really law and gospel right together. There Indeed. isn't there. Whom yeah. you crucified, that's the law. Yeah. Christ is raised. Indeed. That's the gospel. Yeah. And this, you know, Luther refers to this. If you haven't read the book, I think one of the one of the greatest texts uh, outside the Bible for explaining this basic way of interpreting the scripture is by a man named C.F.W. Walther. Some of you may have heard this name. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read Walther's Law and Gospel. You know, uh, C.F.W. Walther is the, considered the founding father of the what became the Lutheran Church in Missouri Synod. Um, but his, his, his writing is, and there is an abridged version of it available, but it's really, really good. If, you, if, if you're if you want to study a little bit deeper in preparation for your own personal witness, um, and you're you're willing to be challenged a little bit, Walther's Walther's writing on this is really is really fantastic, um, and you know because Luther speaks Luther speaks about this in a way that, that I think is very powerful. It, it, it's the highest and most difficult art of being a Christian is rightly dividing, distinguishing law and gospel, right. When, when to lay it on the line, when the people in the earth, right? Um, how many of you are parents? <laughs> right? So I, you know, this, is, this is right at the heart, I think, of being a Christian parent. And all the kids are different. You know, I know, you know one, one of my kids, um, you know, I'm Irish Italian. I have, a, I have I, a genetic predisposition to be loud. In, in your face, and one of my kids cannot handle. You know, just if if I get if I get loud with this particular child, I have, for the most part, failed. I, I you know it turns it off. shuts down, and so. Whereas another one, I kind of need to get in this kid's <laughs> face, right? And even this, so, how you speak that is it. This is so we should not. This is hard. <laughs> You know, it's one thing with your kids who you think you know fairly well. It's another thing with people maybe that you don't. But this are the, the heart and soul of Christian witness is law and gospel. You know, convicting of sin and proclaiming the forgiveness and resurrect the resurrection and forgiveness that, that is in Christ. So that's not easy. And I think too, it, it can't be watered down. Yeah. You know, it's not. It's it's not always happy. No, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes this is hard. Right. Um, there's also, and we'll come, we'll come back to this. In fact, remind, remind me. I'm gonna. One of the questions is gonna encourage us to take the long view on some of our relationships. So remind me of that when we come to that. Okay. So um, I also had circled number five. The quotation from Psalm 118: <clears throat> "The stone that was rejected by you, the builders, has become the cornerstone." So who's the stone? Jesus, Jesus is Jesus is the stone. Um, the, the couple questions that we have before. So what does this mean for some and for others? And what does this mean for our individual and church-wide witness? What do you think? 
Jesus is the stone that has been rejected, that has become the cornerstone. I think he's keeping us my rock. Mm -hmm. My personal. Right. My personal yep. Rock. Yeah, for you, it's something you stand firm on. For others, it's what? A stumbling, stumbling block. block. Yeah, it becomes yeah. something that it's, it's hard. And this is, right? You know, I think in our in our witness, as we ponder how to do this, it's 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 good to remember that on the surface, this seems crazy. You you, just, you step outside it. Okay, so a, a a God became a man who was born of a virgin, and then he died in such a way that this pays the price for all the punishment for all sin and rose from the dead. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it, it just, it, I, I think to be fair, it seems, it seems fanciful, um, bizarre. Um, and I, I think that's helpful to remember it. I, I, my priest position, it calls us to a certain degree of humility, patience. Um, you know, I, mean, I heard this for years and thought it was foolishness. Yeah. And it wasn't until I really knew that I needed forgiveness that, that it became something that I seriously reconsidered. How do you convince somebody of that? Uh, you, I don't think you do. I can't convince my son when I go to church and my daughter dropped him. <coughs> I, I don't I don't think you I don't think you can convince I, I think Yeah, that's and that, this is I think you I think we simply have to speak the truth as the Lord gives us opportunity and pray that in the Lord's and this is where you know we get talking about the long view of things is you know keeping your Keeping lines of communication open, and and also in this lesson to remember, you know, that there's boldness here. I mean, I, I, my sense is with family in particular. I think I think some sometimes we're willing to risk maybe a friendship, but it's really hard to risk risk family. And it's speaking speaking the truth in love. And that's that's I think that really has to be our prayer is because with you know, with family right in particular you think you know it, from a Christian standpoint in a, a family member who's outside or who's rejecting this or you know on the edges it, you want to just shake them and say you know you're missing out on so much and my sense is usually that probably doesn't. <laughs> they sure don't. see us. And they see us. You know what I mean? What yeah. We do. Yeah. And I think eventually with our prayers and everything, yep. like God said, they won't be lost. Yeah. They were brought in. Okay. And it's pray just, that the word pray, pray that the <laughs> word will do its work. And my daughter knows better. I sent her kids two years to St. Matthews and I paid yeah. for it so they go. So she had to go every Sunday and I made sure they went with me. She gets married and he got married in the church because he wanted to marry church and then bingo, the next day, everything's off. Yeah. And if I say anything, he gets mad, he's loud. <laughs> 20 years in the army, you know, it's just... Yeah. I remember... Covering his neck. <laughs> you know, after, and towards, you know, the end of my rebellion when I was breaking in my early 20s, um, I remember... My, uh, a man that I worked for in the Michigan legislature who was a, an evangelical Christian, um, he said to me in a conversation, he said, Lance, you are a broken man. And I was PO'd at that. You know, who are you? Um, you know, and so I didn't say that to him, but I'm thinking, and, but in fairly short order, I knew he was right. And, I, and the truth is, I knew he was right the minute he said it. Unfortunately, some of us have to really be broken. 
before, and you know, I don't wish that on anybody, but I do, I do, I do pray that for all that they would, they would know the peace of Christ, and if that's what it takes, then some of us are very stubborn. <laughs> but, and that's, you know, that, that's how it is. Um, and some people are so angry towards religion. There was a yeah. just a bad, really, really down of an editorial in the, in the last week's Sunday paper. And this man said that we're shoving, Christians are shoving, you know, Jesus Christ down the throats of children. And it just, it just, it made me feel horrible. I mean, you could just feel his anger. Yep. You know, and his, his hate, what he was, he was just so mad. I think that was part of the problem. I sent them to St. Matthews because that's where I was going at the time. And they act like they're better than everybody else. They said, that's it. This <laughs> might as well be a cult. You can't be friends with anybody too else. Too much, else too, much, too much long. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can be, and that, you know, I want us to be careful. Um, well, they heard them. They're supposed to not pray with others. Yeah. You that know. was it. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, I want us to, I want us to be careful that, um, And this is related to today's sermon. We need ourselves to understand that we too are sinful. And you know, Jesus, Jesus knew how to lay it on when to lay it on the line, and, and when to, when you know when to, when and he you know Jesus has the advantage of being God. <laughs> right? Well, you know, and you know, none, of, none of us are. And I think even in our, even in our best even in our best days, at our best times, we usually mess it up in some way. And so, yeah. And when we have opportunity, and this is what we talked about this today, when we have opportunity to talk to others, it's those out those outside the church. I think often look at Christians. You know, you're you're supposed to be perfect, and and if you're not, well, then you know, you're just a fraud and a, and a hypocrite. Well, the reality is everybody is, and you know, and we shouldn't we shouldn't claim to be perfect as such, um, and be careful that we we act with some humility, <coughs> especially in public. And that's hard, yeah. Um, with the people who are angry, uh, I was a Stephen minister, and uh, I worked with a man who was not a member of our church, and he was angry at God. Mm -hmm. And we would meet with them once a week for an hour, and I met with him 48 times before we could start talking about God as a God of love, because he had to get that out. And we went over and over, you know, just allowed him to express how angry he was. And eventually he got to a point in which he could listen. Mm. That taught me something about being patient. Because <laughs> I wanted to, you know, I wanted to straighten him out on the third session. It doesn't work until they, they get, get to that point. What was the core of the anger? All was said and done. His father was a Lutheran pastor, oh, and he felt wow. that his father had disciplined him too much with the law. And that law gospel thing in relationships is just critical. Mm -hmm. There was something on TV, and I can't remember which show, what these people were talking, and this guy said he was angry with his father that he constantly had negative reactions with his father and the person said to him the next time you meet with your father hug him and that in the tv show at least made a change rather than just putting up a front and arguing mm -hmm. hug it and that in relationships is critical because mm -hmm. god does that for us yeah, yeah infinitely almost infinitely patient <laughs> It's a good point. It's a tough gig. I mean, you know, I when I meet, you know, we had a we had another baptism uh, last night, and when I meet with families, you know, especially with with young ones getting getting ready for baptism, 
part of my encouragement to them is make this a regular thing, come to church. And, it, and I, I was one of those that come from outside this. I mean, we didn't go to church, right? I mean, we went, we always went on Easter, but maybe on Christmas. Not, it wasn't always on Christmas. And I see a real, there's a real advantage, I think, in parenting for regular worship. And you know, we, every one of us can be filled with pride, and there's an advantage of standing there next to your child and confessing your sins. And I think, I, I tend to think it makes it easier when you go home and you do something stupid as a parent, which is pretty much daily for any of us who are parents. Uh, and you've set a context by regular worship of, uh, by doing that, being able to say, once you're able to swallow your pride, hey kid, I'm sorry, you know, forgive me. There's a, there's a, being in worship regularly has a real, you know, we too are accountable for there's a tendency among parents, I think we exalt our, we can exalt ourselves and make ourselves gods in our home. Um, or sometimes we make the children gods in our home. I think that's probably the bigger sin of our culture is the children become the center of everything and, um, and they pick up on that real quickly. And you know, that, that becomes a problem. So we need, you know, there's a need, there's a need to speak with boldness and, and yet, and Truth, and you pray. You pray for the. You pray for the right time. You know, some there are times, right? Sometimes you you got to lay it on the line. And these guys did that. I guess yeah. the one said to me, "Do you really think you're going to hell if you miss church on Sunday?" <laughs> and I said, "No, that's not it at all, dear." You know, I said, "I just love being in church." You know, I said, yes. I said yes. when I got <laughs> That's why we didn't feel good, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see, that. Yeah, but he became almost more than I was about going to church every yeah. Sunday when we did it, you know, together. Yeah. He grew love it just like I did, but yeah. he was not raised in the church either, you yeah. know. And so that's That's a different crazy. situation with someone who was. And you've got to kind of realize that, I think, and just be patient. <laughs> Yeah. Well, again, I, you know, I have the advantage. If I don't show up, I lose my job. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, you gotta come prepared. That, that not only not only do I have to show up, I have to be ready to go. Yeah. Um, next one I have is number nine that I have circled here. Wait, I really got off. On page three. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. Um, Peter recognizes that the council's edict is contrary to the command of God. Okay? And so he tells the Sanhedrin uh, in certain terms. He's bold. Increasingly, we ask here, it seems that biblically confessional Christians are being told to be silent. And give some examples, uh, personal or otherwise, and talk about how we can follow the apostles' example here. Remember, they said, you know, you have to be silent. And Peter said, well, let's let's look at it. Just, we just, you know, we must help me. We must, this is this is stronger than he, that what he said before. Must follow the odds. In order that we spread no further among the people, warn them to speak no more in this name. So they call them in, charge them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John answered them, "Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge." Which is as we talked about last week. If you think you're higher than God? That's on your conscience. But uh, we cannot speak. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Yeah, laid it right out there. So, you know, how maybe how maybe are we being told to be silent, and how can we follow the the apostles' example here? Any thoughts on this one? Sure. By other things. 
Sure. Uh, yeah. In the public schools now, we know they no longer have Christmas break. They have winter break. Yeah. Right. yeah. You know, you don't have yeah. Easter vacation. Yeah. You have spring, spring break. break. So, right. But when I was a child, it wasn't that way. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was. Well, I was. I was thrilled here when my daughter was in the choir. I mean, they actually. They actually did a couple. Actual Christmas songs at the at the Oak Highland High School. I was, you know, thrilled to thrilled to hear it. I mean, if only because, <laughs> right? This is part of our culture, it is. right? I mean, you know, and you're you're missing, and, and some of the stuff is just flat out beautiful, and you're depriving, depriving, you know. So there's that. Um, you know, what are the what are the two things that you're not supposed to talk about? With <laughs> right, which, um, which, my two favorite subjects, but, the, uh, <laughs> but you know, you think it now. I mean, think about what that means. Well, some people can't discuss things without arguing if you don't go their way. Right. Well, and that's and and that's a good point. You know, you can't discuss it without without arguing, and that or. I think we need to try and find a way because, right, let's start with politics. Politics is about how we organize our life together right. as communities. I mean, I, would th I think we have to talk about that. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i happy to talk, I guess, about the Packers. And, you know, I mean, I played quarterback. I love watching Aaron Rodgers throw a football. It's a miraculous thing. Does it, you know, it's an amazing thing to watch. But um, eventually that's of no really significant no. value. I mean, I, you know, I appreciate the hard work and the skill that goes into that, or, you know, or baseball, or, you know, or what have you, or, you know, or gardening, right? Uh, whatever, whatever, you know, there's a beautiful things, but how we organize our life together, you know, you, you can't talk about the, you know, I, I, I think the more recent, right, the, the Obama administration, you know, edict from the Ed Department of Education that, that demands that schools open locker rooms so if you self-identify as a girl you can go in the boys you know you can go, you know if you're a male anatomically I mean that this that edict came down from the Department of Ed with there was there's it didn't go through Congress there's no discussion of this I, I you know I think personally civically I think that's a tragedy and I, I, those are conversations I think we we have to have, we have to have. I don't you know we didn't I don't think we had the Supreme Court's decision the Obergefell last last summer on um, you know, same sex marriage. Um, there was there wasn't any I think really great civic discussion over this. You know, the, this the an issue came up and the, the Supreme Court said it's this way and. You know, it's as if now, now it, for many, it's if, well, the Supreme Court has decided, therefore the discussion is over. Um, so help me God, no. Because, I, this, you know, at least it, I don't think, I think we should talk about that. And we have to figure out a way to talk about marriage and God's design for marriage. You know, I mean, right? Isn't it our right as Americans to talk about those things, and not just within the confines of the wall. We talked about this last week in relation to Memorial Day. The First Amendment says we have the right to the free exercise of religion. That means we actually get to practice it, um, not just talk about it uh, on Sunday. So, I mean, so we just, the civic side of that, you know, when, when you hear that from people, maybe that's an, that's an intro to a conversation. Isn't, isn't politics about how we organize our life together as a community? Let's talk about this a little bit. And, you know, there's a passage in James, part in James 1, be quick to listen and so to speak. So, you know, most of us probably have strong beliefs and passions about this, but maybe if we can invite the conversation, and as you did with the man, you know, you had 48 sessions with the man, you know, before... Maybe that's what we need to do. And the same thing goes perhaps with the religious conversation. Just, you know, open open the door and be prepared to listen a lot. We, we, we talk about this with that with that James passage. You know, be 
quick to listen and slow to speak. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a bit cliche in our circles, but you know, I'm preaching to myself when I say this. God gave us two ears and <laughs> one mouth. <laughs> and one mouth. I mean, I think perhaps He means us to use those things in that <laughs> yeah, other examples you can think of? Not to go, not, not to be more of the positive here in terms yeah. of how to, how to respond in terms of this situation. One of the reasons that, you know, conversation is just so limited in terms of normally. I like to open it up with something that they don't expect. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, how are you doing? I say, blessed every single day. Yeah. And if they say, that's a wonderful attitude, and I, I then as I take that as an opening and I say, and I hope you feel the same way too. You know, so it invites and engages and more than the usual. I'm fine. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that is a cultural thing. You can, yeah. you can surprise people. Yeah, you can. Because we, we ask that and we usually don't really mean it. We say, how are you doing today? And when we're actually just saying hello. Um, so, if, you know, you can take that as an opportunity. You know, well, how are you today? So if you're going to ask the question, you should expect, you know, how are you today? Actually, I feel like dog meat right now. <laughs> get that once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> Some say I feel like crap. Right, right. Well, okay. if you do, then you should, you know, if we're going to ask the question, you should ask be prepared, you should be pre prepared to, prepared to be. If you have no interest in actually how the person is, then just say, hi. I thought I was going to cause an accident, though, at the corner down here, because I was going towards the post office, and a young man had smiled and said hello to me, how are you, how are you today? And so I responded to that as I was crossing the street. Oh. And he said, that's a wonderful response. And he stopped. Like, he said, I didn't know it. You know, it's like, so I wish that I had turned around and gone back and said, engaged him when he's with his girlfriend. So I probably would have just <laughs> otherwise <laughs> occupied. Yes. <Yeah. laughs> How about some other examples? Well, yes, sir. You can't put, you know, the city can't put different price-based sure. things out yep. anymore. You know, um, like Ten Commandments or, or the uh, crush of two Christmas. This is one of the challenges I think for Christians is that, yeah, you know, and I'm, this is gonna this is gonna sound political, and perhaps it is. If religious freedom is important for us then not only do we need to talk about it, but we also need to be able to support the religious freedom of others with whom we disagree. Um, and for Missouri Synod types, this should be a big deal. This, this was a huge deal. Uh, this was a huge deal at our founding, right? The, the people who came here from Germany and founded the Lutheran Church in Missouri Synod did so because they were, in large part, they were being forced to worship against conscience. And they found here an opportunity to worship according to conscience. And we are more pluralistic now. I mean, there are a lot more different. That, that, it's just something I would encourage us to remember. If, if we want the freedom to be able to preach and teach and live out what we believe, um, that is going to mean for us that we're going to have to occasionally stand with people with whom perhaps we disagree profoundly um, for their right to do so too. So, you know, I, for, in, I'm perfectly happy to have a crash, right, if the city wants to do that. But, um, if, and this is going to sound controversial, but if a Muslim group comes along and wants to put up some symbol on one of their sacred holidays, if we want ours, I think we need to be willing to let them have, to have theirs. Um, you know, and we have to decide. I think that's part of the price of. I think that's part of the price of freedom. Um, you know, if we want it only only our way, as long as it's Christian symbols. Well, we have to be careful too. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, just, yeah, in that you know, and maybe, and maybe and maybe and maybe that's and maybe that's yeah. an opportunity. Maybe that's an opportunity for us, right? Because. And we've had some kind of, I, mean, I did some study in this in my missiology degree. They have some knowledge of Jesus. It's, it's wrong, um, but you know, if, if you, if you, 
if you rec if you use the red letter red letter version of your Bible, you know, there's an opening there. They have some they have some respect for him. And you know, we have this fall. I think I'm going to have my friend uh, Hisham Shahab come and do a do a presentation for us. Awesome. Yeah, he was a he was a trained um, Lebanese soldier um, and and encountered the love of Christ while in the hospital, uh, recovering. And and now he's a now he's a Lutheran pastor. Um, so let's go to number twelve. So reference here to verses twenty nine and thirty, you know, where they pray, yeah. you know, now Lord look upon their threats and grant you your servants to continue to speak the world with boldness. Uh, you stretch out your hand to heal. So recognizing, right, that God that's doing the healing and sign and wonders are performed through the name of your servant Jesus. Um, we asked there, is it time for us to start praying this prayer? Mm -hmm. And if so, how, how might we do this? talked about in the study what they could have prayed for. You know, Lord, keep us safe and Lord, help us to... But rather, they, they, rather than that, they prayed in the face of opposition. They prayed for what? They both to speak boldly. Yeah, they prayed for boldness. And um, here's an... So for those of us who are a little bit older and have watched our culture really kind of shift dramatically. This is where maybe there's an opportunity for us who are a little older to talk to our teens and 20-somethings and early, you know, early 30s. If you've got good, solid, you know, church-going young people, they grew up in this change, you know, whereas you know, kind of for those of us who are a little bit older, it happened, but they're they're living in the midst of it, and this might be an opportunity for a conversation with your children or grandchildren who are practicing the faith of how they navigate this. There might actually be an opportunity for some learning for some of us who are older, you know, because they work in workplaces, they have friends, um, they go to college, and you know, the, and the culture has shifted dramatically, and how they how do they navigate this? That, it might be a good opportunity for conversation with some younger with some younger believers. Yeah. My granddaughter Tori um, was the church work, but on and off, you know, mm -hmm. until she met this boy who yeah. had been in church court. Yeah. And she brought him to church, and he really liked it. Yeah. And now uh, he brings her. He makes yeah. her come all good. the time. <laughs> oh, good. And yeah. I said, "Wow, this is neat." You know. Yeah, that's how that's how I ended up, right? It was right. Yeah. yeah. Someone from the opposite side. I was a, well, a you know, yeah, I dated this pious Lutheran girl in high school and started going to church with her. So my father my father was convinced that it was I had nothing but ulterior motives, which he wasn't entirely wrong. <laughs> he wasn't entirely wrong. But he wasn't he was certainly wasn't right. There was I was I was genuinely, uh, as a kid, I, grew up, I was genuinely fascinated mm -hmm. um, by Katie's family because I, you know, I've told this story many times before. I remember that I went; they invited me over for dinner, and um, my high school girlfriend's her father was a a good, pious Lutheran Church Missouri Synod dentist, and they did a devotion before their family meal. I had never seen such a thing before. <laughs> I, it was, and I, you know, I had been basically taught that, you know, really observant Christians were basically cultists, you know, the kind of wacko, you know, these people would sacrifice a, you know, an animal or something like that. And um, I mean, honestly, God, that's kind of how I felt. This is, and they were normal. <laughs> I, I was really, I was really surprised. But this was, you know, their God was central to who they were as a family. And I, I honest to God, I'd never, that I can, I'd never really been with on a significant time. People like that. It was, it was intriguing to me. So, you never know. Um, 
So the question is, you know, is it time to start praying for boldness? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So how? I had that you should do it with gentleness and respect. Yep. Right. Yeah. That's the that's the that's the passage. All right. Okay. Do so with gentleness and respect. Right. I always felt that if you can share something that you experience personally, mm -hmm. that that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. To just all of a sudden start talking about Jesus. And yep. At the end, at the end of the day, you want to. We want to get to the point. But the, at the end of the day, this is this is what you know for the apostles. There is this objective fact of the resurrection of Jesus. Ultimately, we all have to contend with this: Who is this Jesus? Because if he really is raised from the dead, I mean, all these conversations eventually that we need to get to that get to that point. And for me, that's absolutely what it was. Ultimately, I, you know, I had to contend with, and this is, you know, C.S. Lewis and Mere Christianity was a very influential book for me. It just drove me to this. The witness of the Gospels is clear. These documents are very reliable according to historical standards. <coughs> they all proclaim that Jesus is raised from the dead. If that's true. If that's true, well, then I'm not God. <laughs> then I'm not Lord of my life. It's ultimate. That, so the, the stumbling block, right, <coughs> it, for some who stumble, but ultimately that's, that's where everything, that's where everything and, that, and that's what Peter and John did here. It's Jesus, whom you crucified. God raised him from the dead. You know, and they couldn't find a body. They couldn't find a body. <coughs> so, you know, we have, we have to contend with that. And that's that's really the last question, too, which is number two. <coughs> Discuss boldness in light, of, in light of 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. That's <coughs> Carolyn to speaking with gentleness and respect. What? And the fisherman's friend? Yeah. That's that's the that's the discipline of what's called apologetics. Yeah. You got it? You got a cough drop there? Well, yeah, I guess fishermen's friends. Oh, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I thought you were oh. calling me a fisherman's friend. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard of it. I'll take one. They're, they're very strong, but they do they All do right. the job. Well, I need to speak with boldness in a few minutes here. So. <laughs> Once again. Once again. No. Um, I, I noted in my, in my leader notes here, this is what I wrote. Through St. Peter, the Lord calls us to speak with gentleness and respect, to expect to be slandered. This is very, very hard. Expect to be what? Slandered. 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 Oh, slandered. Yeah. Thank you. My, you must, my hair, one of my hair no. days just went. <laughs> we must expect <laughs> opposition. Right. We must expect opposition and plan for it. Plan for, pray to overcome also our own sinful inc inclinations yeah. and actions. Um, and, on, and on the other side, we can expect results. So we have to be prepared for that. Right. Yeah. You know, welcoming people, yep. ministering to them, encouraging them, which is all a big job, too. Yep. But this, you know, in these, this, this will flow, this lesson flows into what we talked about this, this weekend. We should have our eyes open, understand the, you know, the reality. This is, this is why I think the, the stuff that we'll talk about next week is really helpful. We understand ourselves, <laughs> you know, and the reality within, that, which again we'll talk about next week that should help us to speak with gentleness and respect, but we, we cannot hide that light under a bushel. Um, it, 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 needs, it needs to shine with brightly, but with humility, as it were. Marcus, you look like you're pondering there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
down. The King Bird statue. As we close in prayer here, I want uh, I want you all and not to name them out loud, but I want you to think of somebody, some at least some one person or some small group of people who you know that with whom you need to speak. And let's pray now that God would provide us the opportunity and the wisdom to speak with love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, for all of us here, you place certain people in our lives, perhaps who wouldn't walk through the doors of the church, and you have situated us, each of us, uniquely to be able to reach them. We pray that you would open their hearts to the message of Christ and that you would grant us wisdom, patience you know, to listen and at the right time to speak in love. This we pray, Lord Jesus, in your name and for your sake. Amen. Thank you, everyone. And we'll definitely shut off that camera.